Discover the power of Aura with a wide variety of 2D paint and animation techniques for logos, text, and image processing. Learn anim brush effects, stroke recorder techniques, rotoscoping, color keying, wipe effects, image mapping, and more. Apply Aura's powerful scripting capabilities for complex image manipulation. Create multi-layered composites, dynamic logo animation, and textured imagery, all with this powerful animation tool. Realize the full potential of LightWave's powerful features. Discover essential techniques for the advanced modeling and animation capabilities of endomorphs, skeletons, weight maps, multi-meshes, and more. Create multi-layered and animated textures, gradients, and apply UV mapping. Add realism to your rendering environment with volumetrics, caustics, and radiosity techniques. Plus, a variety of modeling, animation, surfacing, and rendering tips and tricks. Cut your learning curve and increase your animation ability with this powerful training series. Learn to create high-quality animated graphics with hardcore LightWave logos. Digital artist Tony Stutterheim provides hands-on instruction for modeling, composition, and animation. Learn special effects, lighting tricks, and surface techniques. Build text objects, convert logo artwork, add dimension, motion sequences, and lighting effects to build network-style animation. Take an insightful look at these key concepts for creating graphic and logo animation in LightWave 3D. Uncompressed digital video creation is easy with the new Video Toaster training series. Video Toaster Creative Concepts explores the fundamental features of nonlinear editing, title creation, animation, and 3D effects. Learn basic editing techniques, adding transitions, title overlays, and audio mixing. Create animated logos, text overlays, and add 3D effects. It's everything you need to get up and running fast with beyond broadcast quality video creation. All this and more, available now from Desktop Images. Dear Video Professional, the elements of this videotape represent the work of creative professionals like yourself. Unauthorized duplication of this tape not only is a federal crime, but also contributes to the destruction of an industry that you help create. Please do your part by not duplicating this videotape. Thank you. Hi, this tape is a short introduction to Aura 2. This tape will give you the basics you need to get going, setting up your temp file, loading and saving images, and starting to actually work in Aura 2. Let's take a look. When you first start Aura 2 up, you come to the configuration screen. The configuration screen is set to standard the first time you run it. You definitely want to make your own configuration, so you click on the new button, and you type in a name for your config, I'll call mine Don, and I go. The reason I do this is, if I leave it on the standard configuration, all of the settings that I make in Aura, such as my keyboard shortcuts, where I position my windows, will not be remembered when I come back into the program. It will be back to its default settings. So by making your own configuration, all of the customized settings that you make in Aura 2 will be there the next time you come back to the project. When working with importing video sequences, the way that the project was originally configured can affect what shows up in the requester for importing the sequence. When you start out, if you have your field selected to none, and we enter the project, we're now set up for no fields in this project. So when I go up and I say I want to import a video sequence, so I want to import sequence, and I click on an importable sequence, whatever it may be, when my requester comes up, it only gives me two options. It gives me the full frame option, and you get the fixed motion option, because there is no fielding options available because the project was set up with no fields. Now, if you set the project up with fields, and I don't have to exit out of Aura to do that, I can go up to the top, and I can go to the Project menu, and go to Modify Project, and here are my field settings right here. So again, if these are set to either odd or even, so that Aura is set up to work with fields, when I now go ahead and say I want to import a video sequence, and I click on the sequence to import it, I now get the options of importing uh, the fields even first or the fields odd first. 
Now I can also set the resolution of the project and I can use this pop-up to look at all my preset resolutions. I'm gonna go ahead and choose NTSC D1. We can also adjust our aspect ratio and frame rate and our starting frame here. Let's go ahead into Aura. Loading stills and video in Aura is quite easy. Go to your file requester, and if we want to import an image, we go to Import, Image, and I can do a scan. I already have scanned this directory, and it shows me little thumbnails of what all my images look like. Actually, I didn't scan the whole thing. If I continue to scan, it shows me what all of my imagery looks like. And if I want to load up a image, I can simply double-click on it, and it will tell me that my current project is bigger than the image. The image I'm trying to load is smaller. Do I want to stretch the image to fit the project or just load the image? I'll go ahead and stretch it. And here's my image stretched to fit my project. Now, I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And if I want to load video, I simply go to the requester and I say I want to import a sequence. And I'm going to go to my video directory here, my animations directory. And again, I can scan the animations and if I want to see what one of the animations looks like, I can right click on it and it will play the animation back for me through Aura's preview. I can then scrub this preview, look at the uh, video playing, I can loop the preview. If I decide this is the piece of video that I want to load, I simply close the, pro the preview and I double click on the icon for the piece of video. Now in the load requester gives me a lot of options. And the first is mark in and mark out. If I don't want to use the entire piece of video, I can choose what portion I want to use. I can slide this slider, and you'll see when I let go of the slider, it updates our little thumbnail there. If you want to see that in real time, you can hold down the control key as you slide with the left mouse, and you get real time update. So hold the control key and slide for real time. Then I can say, okay, I want my endpoint to be right there, and I can click on mark in. And then I can go ahead and slide that out. Say I want my out point to be there, and I can mark out. And now it's only going to load that portion of the video. Now down here I have some more options. I can load the video as full frame, or double field even first, or double field odd first. If I'm going to be creating a project that's not going to have lateral motion in it, I would use full frame because I don't need fields. If I'm going to have stuff moving around in the project window, I'm definitely going to want to field it on the way in and on the way out. If I'm working with a video toaster and I'm working in 720 by 480, I want to use odd first. If I'm working at 720 by 486 or I'm working in PAL, I want to use even first. If you're not working with a video toaster and you're working with one of the other supported pieces of hardware, you want to look at the manufacturer specs to find out whether or not they're doing even or odd fields first. We can also stretch our video to match our project. If our video is bigger or smaller than the project that we're working in, I can choose this button right here to stretch the video to fit my project. One of my favorite new buttons is this button right here called Preload. And what Preload does is it allows me to create any layer as a video layer or what we now call a buffered layer. If I take this piece of video, and let me go ahead and say I'm only going to load 30 frames of it, so I'll mark that as my out point. And if I have Preload checked, when I load it, we'll see that it actually loads all 30 frames individually, and now the frames are down here on my timeline, and I can manipulate them all as individual frames. But let's say I just wanted to have a piece of video either in the background or maybe even a transparent bug spinning down in the bottom corner. It's just going to be there all the time. I'm not really going to manipulate it. It can be a buffered layer. So if I wanted to load this as a buffered layer, I'm going to go ahead and delete that layer right now. I would come back to Import Sequence, select it, and say, don't preload it for me. And watch what happens when I click load. Bang. Instantaneously loads the layer for me. There is no waiting for each individual frame to load. But I can't manipulate that now. I can't run filters on it. Uh, the things I can do with a buffered layer is I can move them in time. If I come down here to my timeline, and I'm going to zoom out on my timeline using my interactive zoom button right here, the Z for interactive zoom, zooming in and out on the timeline. I'm not changing the length of the video now. I'm changing the zoom factor on the timeline here. So I can take a buffered layer and move it. So it could start later on in my project. It's not something that has to be there all the time. And I can also create or load a sequence that's got alpha in it, like a 32-bit target sequence. I can load that as a buffered layer. Now it's going to have its transparency built into it, and it's going to run 
and load instantaneously for me without having to load each individual frame by itself. Again, one of the things to remember is I can't scrub through this like I can a regular layer. And I can create this into a regular layer if I want by right clicking on it. Let's say I load a buffered layer and then a little bit later I decide, oh, wait a minute, I really want to run a filter on that. There's something I need to do to it. If I right click on it, I can say I want to go ahead and make edit. And this is going to change the video layer into an anim layer for me automatically. So now I have individual frames and I can apply filters to them, so on and so forth. Another thing to remember about a buffered layer, and if I hit the U key for undo, it's going to go ahead and change that back into a buffered layer for me, uh, is that I can't manipulate it like a regular layer. If I come down here and I'm hitting the delete key, if I select this layer, notice I can't even select it. This layer is selected, but I can't click on this layer to select it. If I want to delete a buffered layer, I need to right click on it and delete the layer in order to get rid of it because it's not a regular video layer. I can't manipulate it. I can't apply filters to it. I can't stretch it. I can't do a lot of things that I can do to an editable video layer that's made out of frames. And again, to get rid of them, I need to right click on it, go ahead and hit delete. The nice thing about the video layers is though, as that's different from Aura 1, is I can have as many of them as I want. In Aura 1, you only had one in the background. Now in Aura 2, I can have as many video layers as I want, and I can move them in time, which I also couldn't do in Aura 1. Aura has a very powerful text tool. I'm going to click on the A in my tool panel to get to my text tool. And I'm going to go ahead and move this up a little bit so we can see everything in the text tool. And down here is the string. This is where I type in the text that I want. I have Aura 2 typed in. You also have a history of what's been typed in. That's the only thing I've typed in, so I don't see anything else. But if I type something else in there like video toaster, and I want to go back to Aura 2, it's there for me in my history. Another nice thing about Aura is real-time previews in our project window. If I adjust the size of the word, I can see it in real time in my project window. And we also have two new modes in the tool text brush window itself. And they are the letter mode and the word mode. And in the letter mode, I can actually paint with my text. And this comes in handy in a lot of different ways. But I can also go to the word mode. and this attaches the entire word to my text. And if I just want to stamp that down, I can stamp it down without having to come down and actually create a brush. At the bottom of the text tool, there's a button that says Create Brush, which actually creates it as a brush. And now I can go and edit this brush with my brush edit settings. Also, if I like this brush and I want to keep it, I can go to my bin, and I can click in the bin, and it's going to save that brush for me, and I can have instant access to it. Here I have a video toaster logo, and if I want my text brush, I've got it back with its transparency ready to go. Let's go ahead and take the brush that we've created. I'm going to hit clear to get rid of the text that I stamped down. I'm going to come to my layers panel here, and we're going to do a little keyframing with this text. We're going to go ahead and make this 30 frames, and I can see my frame count right up here in the upper left-hand corner of my layers panel is my frame count. So I've got 30 frames there, and now I'm going to use my auto fit pop up here to fit my project, and it automatically fits the project to the visible portion of my timeline. I'm going to go ahead and make this an animated layer by right clicking on it, say make anim, and now I'm going to bring up my keyframer. The keyframer is under filters, motion keyframer, and the keyframer allows me to keyframe X, Y, and Z position, H, P, and B position, height and width, and some effects down here like noise, motion, blur, and opacity. So I'm going to do a very simple keyframe here. I want to keyframe on the z-axis from in the background coming forward again. So I'm going to click Preview, and I can now see the brush. And if I grab the brush by the side of its border here, I can drag it and move it around. It's very important that you drag it from the corner or the side of the brush, especially when you get multiple keyframes. But I'm going to say I want it to start here. And with the right mouse button, I can drag that into the background with the right mouse button. There it is. Now, here on my timeline, I'm going to come out to frame 30. And on frame 30, for under XYZ, there's a button that says C. This is for center, and it centers that brush for me back to where it was in its original spot. And I can now left click and drag here above the timeline, and I get a real time preview in my project window of what that's going to look like. If I'm happy with that, I right click on the layer and say select all to select the entire layer. 
and then I apply the filter. The animation is now complete and again, I can not only grab on my timeline and scroll through it like I could with my preview, but I can actually make a preview by hitting the button on the layers panel down here that looks like a little play button that says right next to my preview screen and this plays a preview of the animation that I created. Now another new feature in Aura is the ability to keyframe our filters. All the Aura filters are now keyframable. So if I want to come out here and pick a filter, like maybe we'll go with mosaic, and I'll say here at frame zero, I want the mosaic filter to be at five by five. Actually, let's really crank it up. We're going to go 20 by 20. So it's very, very mosaic. But then out here at frame 30, I'm going to want it to be one and one. Now, I select the entire layer again, and I apply this filter, and we can see the mosaic filter animated over time. I'm going to hit undo a couple of times to get back to where I don't have the mosaic filter on there. And notice, as I scrub through here, you can see in the mosaic requester a preview of it before I actually apply the filter because I undid it, that filter's no longer applied. But I can still see it in the mosaic filter, what it's going to look like. But let's say I don't want to keyframe a filter. I want to apply something like a George script. And what is George? George is a scripting language that comes with Aura, allows you to write your own plugins. It's not a programming language, a little bit easier to figure out. A variety of scripts come with Aura. You can load them into any text editor, take a look at how they're working, and start writing your own plugins for Aura. I'm going to run a George script on here called Ramp Blur, and I'm going to select the entire layer, and I'm going to go to George, and I get there by hitting this little hat. Looks like an airplane pilot's hat. Brings up my George bin here. And under all, these are the scripts that come with Aura. And it comes with 35 different scripts. One of them is called Ramp Blur. So I'm going to say, I want to do a Ramp Blur here. And each George script now comes with instructions. Do I want to read the instructions? If I say yes, it actually gives me a little sample over here of what the effect is going to look like and tells me exactly what I'm going to need for this effect to work. Sometimes you need more than one layer. Sometimes it needs to be an anim layer. And it will tell you if you're making a mistake. Once I've read the instructions and I'm happy with that, I click continue. Now what do I want to do? Do I want to ramp my blur up so it gets blurrier over time or ramp my blur down so it's blurry and then comes into focus? I want to ramp down. And what do I want to start the maximum blur setting at? I'll start it at 30. Go ahead and do that for me. And it will go through and it will ramp the blur up for me automatically. Anytime I can get Aura to do the work for me, I'm happy. It tells me how long it took to do the render and now we can scroll through and we can see that we have a nice blur fade kind of effect. Gets very blurry in the background, comes into focus as it comes into the foreground. This is also a great way of faking a depth of field effect where you can have objects coming forward and backward and being going blurry and coming into focus, faking a depth of field effect. Again, there are a lot of useful production oriented scripts that come with Aura and you now have a bin for your George scripts and you can put what maybe your favorite George scripts. There's 35 scripts. Maybe you use five of them all the time and you don't want to have to search through that whole list to get to them. You can load them into the bin and you have instant access to them. There are also a variety of third party scripts available and you could also load those into the bin to have access to those as well. Well now that we've got our animation we're ready to go ahead and save it out. So the first thing I want to do is go up to my file requester here and choose my mode. How am I going to save it? AVI, deep, flick, anything above this line here are animated formats and anything below it are my still image formats. And if I save out a sequence in a still image format, it saves out a sequence of still images in that format for me. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to save it as an RTV, which is the video toaster file format. And then I simply say, let's go ahead and export it. And I say, export the sequence. And it asks me, do I want to export it even first, odd first, or none? And you want to export it the same way you imported it. If I imported it even first, I'm going to want to export it even first. If I import it odd first, I'm going to want to export it odd first. There are certain times when you might want to do this, but it's a good rule of thumb to follow. That's why the option is there, though, if you do want to do it different than what I'm describing to you now. So let's go ahead and say we're going to save this out as even first. I'll say OK. I choose where I want to save it to. I'll save it to my video drive. I'll give it a name and save it. And there it goes. Now I can play that back from my video toaster. I can just double click on it 
in Explorer and it will play back through the video toaster for me. So there's my RTV. Of course, I can save that out as any of those file formats. Works with almost any nonlinear editor on the market. I hope this tape has been helpful in just getting you going using Aura 2. It's a very, very deep program. There's a lot to get into in there. This should be enough to get you going, load some video and start manipulating, playing with the filters, playing with the keyframer. If you want more in-depth training on how to use Aura 2, look for new tapes coming from desktop images on Aura 2. They'll be out soon, and I'll see you on those tapes. Thanks.